y'all. Happy Saturday. I am moving a little bit slow this morning and I'll tell you why. I had to get the kids from a youth event last night. They did not get home until like 1, 1 1.30. So we really didn't get home and situated in the bed until, you know, 1.32. And I just passed smooth out. I was so tired. I worked all night until I had to get them. So I got a lot done. And then at 4.30 this morning, my husband and I were awakened by my daughter and her little friends who were having a sleepover. They had never went to sleep. I don't know if they were trying to pull an all-nighter or what, but we had to go and uh, to inform them that you must sleep so that we can sleep. So, I am moving slow this morning. I apologize that the walk is a little bit later, but it's because, honestly, I didn't get any sleep. And um, I wasn't feeling particularly well this morning either because of it. So I guess I'm getting to the age where if I don't get the sleep I need, it's just not going to be a good day, <laughs> which I've been like that for a while. All right. I want to come to you today and talk about something I taught my Sunday school class last week. I labeled it after sacrifice. And I want to specifically talk about what happens after we sacrifice, what sacrifice looks like. Um, the promises that God has made, but also some other aspects of sacrifice. And I would like to point out a discovery while I was studying and researching and learning something that I noticed and something that I told my class. And I was so thankful that they didn't look at me like I was crazy. As a matter of fact, one of my, one of the people, one of the women in my class came up to me later and said, I really like that, that you said, I've never thought about that before. And I really like it. And I said, well, thank you. I'm glad you didn't think it was weird. And I said, I never thought of it either until I was researching and studying. And I really, I think, I believe that the Lord whispered that to me because I've been thinking about it all week long. And I keep saying it over and over to myself. And I'm about to tell you what it is. Don't worry. So let's jump into the lesson titled After Sacrifice. So I wanted to talk about, let's see, one, two, three, four. I want to talk about five different sacrifices in the Bible and what they look like, but what happened immediately after these sacrifices. And I started with Solomon. Now, because I have a lot to say, and I know my Sunday school lesson was 45 minutes long, and I'm not going to hold you that long. I'm going to go really fast, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit faster. So, Solomon's sacrifice. This is David's son when he first began his reign. He immediately goes, he calls the elders, and he said, let's, you know, let's go worship. So, he goes up to this place, and any other day I could tell you, he went to the brazen altar, and it was in, anyway, not important now, but he goes to the brazen altar. He offers a thousand burnt offerings. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out about this sacrifice from Solomon. Number one, God did not command him to do it. It was of his own free will, um, which is a big deal. So, it wasn't like he was obeying a command. It was inside of him to go and sacrifice a thousand burnt offerings for worship. So, he had a desire to sacrifice to God in worship, and he did it. And he called the elders to go with him, and they all went. Now, when I looked it up, because I never thought about this before, a thousand burnt offerings, how long would that take? When I read stuff like that, I'm like, oh, okay, he just went up, and maybe it took one day or two, maybe a weekend, and then he went back home. And that is not the case because one burnt offering sacrifice done properly takes hours. The cutting of the pieces, the draining of the blood, doing with the blood what you're supposed to do with it, the burning of the bones until they're there no more, takes hours. He would do this a thousand times or he chose to do this a thousand times. So when I was looking it up, the common belief is that this took weeks if not months. So I need that to soak in. It took weeks, but more probably it took months for him to offer a thousand burnt sacrifices, okay, out of his own goodwill. Like he wanted to worship in that way. He wasn't commanded to do it. It was inside of him. And I was telling them, I was like, can you imagine? God didn't tell you to do it. You're not doing it to get anything. He had no clue God was going to talk to him after that. He just did it. Every day you wake up. You chop, drain, burn, repeat for months as an act of worship to God. The Bible says when he was done making a thousand burnt offerings, that night is when God appeared to him and said, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Now, this is interesting to me because Solomon did not know God was going to appear to him. 
Solomon did not know that God was going to ask him whatever he wanted. He would give it to him. He did not make the sacrifice to get anything back. As a matter of fact, he made the sacrifice because he felt compelled to worship. And that's why he did it. The end result of that willing sacrifice out of love, adoration, and worship was that God met him personally and said, basically, you have pleased me. What do you want? I will give you anything you want. Because I love to give people things who love me with no hope of reward. Because it's real love. And it's true love. Who sacrifice out of the willingness of their heart without being told to do it. Is one of the best ways to worship and love God. So you know the story. He shows up and Solomon asked the most, the best request ever. Which made God over the moon. He said, I need, I need wisdom to lead your people. I need wisdom to do it correctly, to do the job you've given me correctly. And God is so pleased. He said, oh, I'll give it to you. Nobody else will be as wise as you. And I'll give you all the other things that you did not ask for, like wealth and abundance. So that's our first sacrifice. It was a willing sacrifice of worship. I know I'm going fast. So stay with me. The next sacrifice I want to talk about was Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac, right? When we read that chapter in Genesis, it starts out with... God commanded Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one you love, go sacrifice to him. Go sacrifice him to me on this mountain. So I pointed out the wording there because it's interesting. Abraham only had one son and he was a promised son, right? They waited forever to have that child. He was a miracle baby. He loved him dearly. I don't think God had to point that out to him again, but he did. He said, take your son, the only one. And the one that you love and go give them to me. I think my personal opinion of the language there is like, it's almost like God's request is reminding Abraham, this is very valuable to you. It's your son, your miracle son. You don't have any more and you love him dearly. And I know all that. And I want to remind you of that. And now I'm going to ask you to give him up. The Bible says that Abraham gets up the next morning to do what God has said. And again, I was like, how long does this take to get to this particular mountain? It took three days. Three days, Abraham had to wrestle with what he had to do. We look at it and go, okay, but the angel stopped. Yeah, but Abraham didn't know that. As a matter of fact, he goes so far into that sacrifice that he binds his son who does not understand. He does everything. He lays the wood, everything. And then he raises his knife to stab him in the chest and he stops him on the way down. So he had to live that moment repeatedly in his mind for three days till he got there. And then he carried out everything but the end result. We talked about how traumatic that was for Isaac, who doesn't have any understanding of what's going on, who is loved, beloved, right? And all of a sudden he becomes a human sacrifice. All of a sudden his dad gives no explanation and he ties him up and he sticks him on the altar without knowing that why he's doing this. I'm sure between Abraham and Isaac, there were tears. There were screaming. Why are you doing this, daddy? Why are you doing this? Don't do this. Don't do this. I don't want to die. I am, I mean, I would, <laughs> I am sure the sacrifice took a toll on Abraham, a tremendous request. And yet he did it without hesitation. Now I'm not saying he's not human. I believe he wrestled with it for three days. Maybe he even prayed for three days. God, please change it. Please change it. Please change it. I don't know. I wasn't there. But he had to deal with it for three days. But after the sacrifice, of course, God stopped him. He didn't make him kill his son. But after the sacrifice, he said, now I know that you will withhold nothing from me. I will make your ancestors as the sand of the sea. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to bless you more than anybody else. Like, I'm going to do all this for you. Now, Abraham didn't go and ask God for that. He didn't say, okay, I'll go do it if you do this. No. He didn't even know that once he completed God's commandment that he was going to be blessed. He just knew he was told to do it and he had to. That was a sacrifice out of obedience. And once completed, look what happened. Blessings happened. Talk about the widow's might. I'm jumping. In the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples are in the temple. These rich people come in. Nothing wrong with that. But they give, right? Then this widow comes in and she gives a mite. It's like nothing, right? It's not a lot. But it was all that she had. And he says, you see that woman? He points her out. Says, you see her? 
she's given more than all of these other men and women combined. And of course he wanted, he explained that and he said, they gave out of their abundance. They had extra money lying around. They made plenty of money to pay the temple tax and whatever else they needed to do. She has nothing. This is all she's got. She gave it. This type of sacrifice I wrote is a small sacrifice, but great because giving your all might seem small. It's really not small. It's everything. It's a great sacrifice. And so sacrifices look different to different people because my all in an area may be your excess and your excess in an area may be my all. I might not have very much time. So what little time I'm able to give is my all. I might not have, or you might not have very much money, financial means. So whatever you can give is your all. Thankfully, God is a God that sees every sacrifice individually. But someone who sacrifices their, someone who sacrifices their all is noticed by God. Okay. Um, let's look at Elijah and the widow in Kings. Something I like to point out here is that God commanded this widow to sustain Elijah long before he got there. And I've probably talked about this before. I don't know when nobody ever mentions that she was being obedient to the commandment that she had been previously given because he tells Elijah, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee there. She obeyed even in the face of her son and her starving. She just obeyed. And that's a sacrifice to know that you're giving your life because basically she was giving her life. She did not realize that he was going to make sure after her sacrifice that the meal never ran out. I'm going quickly. The last sacrifice I want to talk about is when Israel was delivered out of Egypt. Literally, what happened after their sacrifice is deliverance. Sometimes the answer to your problem and the deliverance from your issue is sacrifice. The Passover lamb was literally a sacrifice. Moses literally went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. God said to let my people go so they can sacrifice and worship. Sacrifice is an act of worship. And that's what I want to end with. But in the way to get out of their bondage was to perform the sacrifice that he asked, which was the Passover lamb of the first year. You know, share it with your neighbor, put the blood on the doorpost so the angel of death doesn't come by. Like you will be delivered by your sacrifice. The thing that I said that this person said that they appreciated, and I've been thinking about it all week, is this. God's love language is sacrifice. And I don't have enough time to talk to you about the five love languages. It's true. It's real. You can go read the book. Basically, you find out what your love language is. Like, how do you feel loved? Is it words of affirmation? Is it physical touch? Is it gifts? Is it quality time? There's five of them. Once you figure that out, and once the person that you are with figures that out, they can love you in the way that you feel it the best. And then you figure out theirs and no two people are alike. So whereas I might like physical touch, my husband might like words of affirmation, which means if he wants me to feel loved in our marriage, he needs to touch me, he needs to hug me. And if I want him to feel loved, I need to tell him how wonderful he is. That's, that is what love languages are. They are real. And as I was studying, I recognized sacrifice is God's love language. You wanna make God feel loved? sacrifice to him that is how he showed his love towards us by giving the ultimate sacrifice of laying down his life so if i want to please him and i want to say i love you so much okay i'm going quickly my phone is losing storage god's love language is sacrifice in the old testament they had a sacrifice to keep their sins rolled ahead every year until he sacrificed his life and then those sins were washed away forever so we don't have to do sacrifices like that anymore thank god but he says in Romans to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So are we called to sacrifice? Absolutely. And that can look like a million different things. But if we want to please God and make him feel loved, it should be a daily part of our walk. If that means sacrificially getting up early to pray when it's not convenient at nine o'clock, it's sacrificial at 530. Maybe that's it. Maybe skipping a meal or fasting, maybe giving up something for him to spend more time in prayer. Okay. And then again, lastly, there is a promise of a reward in Mark 10. We don't sacrifice to get rewards at all. But he did say, Jesus did say, that no man or woman has ever given up riches, houses, land, family members, where they will not be rewarded either. Maybe, probably not in this life, but in the next. And if you want to check that scripture out, it's Mark chapter 10, verse 28 and 30. There is something miraculous that happens after sacrifice. God feels loved. That's what happens and he comes down. And that's enough for me. See you next Saturday.